Hey y'all, welcome to Roots and Refuge Farm. My name is Jess. This is my garden. It's very foggy. Today I want to show it to you. Um, I was going to shoot this garden tour last night, yesterday evening, and when it came around time to doing it, it was still extremely hot. I looked at the forecast and it was going to be 94 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, 34 Celsius at 8 o'clock in the evening. So I was like, you know what, maybe we'll do early in the morning. So I got up this morning about 45 minutes ago at first light. You couldn't even see out here. It was so foggy. Uh, that looks like it's clearing off. So we're going to dive in to looking at this lovely garden. I'm growing in the Midlands of South Carolina. Um, we are in the middle of a heat wave right now. Having really, it's, it's not that it's unusually hot. It gets very hot in South Carolina, but it's also been unusually dry. So the garden's been a little bit of a challenge this week and we've just been honestly trying to keep it healthy until the weather breaks and then it will be better. Well, anytime that it's over 100 degrees daily, 38 Celsius, um, and dry. I mean, that's that's rough conditions for any living thing. Plants are no exception to that. All right, just a quick look into this first high tunnel. Um, I don't have just a ton of stuff to report here other than lots of pretty flowers. I haven't cut anything in the last few days, uh, so some of these need to be deadheaded. I really love these tiny little dahlias. I mean, they look very Zinnias and dahlias are related and these kind of have more of that look, but they're so pretty. And then my other favorite thing in this tunnel right now are the calla lilies. I just love their foliage, but the flowers are also just so elegant and beautiful. I've always loved those. All right, I want to proceed over here. Um, not, a, not a whole lot going on between the tunnels. The strawberries are pretty well done at this point, but this tunnel is really starting to ramp up and be a place I'm visiting a lot to harvest. So this is newly planted. Um, these have been here. This is some watermelons. The idea of growing the watermelons along the side during the summer, we don't ever lower the walls of the high tunnels. We keep our high side walls completely lifted. And then of course we have 50% shade cloth on these. That's what the high tunnel gives us benefit here in hot South Carolina, because we're able to grow things in here with a little bit of a reprieve from the sun. And so these watermelons, the hope is, is that these will grow out the side and kind of out into this area. Um, I think it's gonna be pretty cool. I think it's gonna be a good use of space. We'll see how it goes. Um, here, these are some freshly planted beans and cucumbers. Um, I've not grown cucumbers in the tunnel much, but with the shade cloth, it's kind of season extension in the opposite direction. You know, a lot of people think of season extension being measures that you take to keep your garden warm when it's cool outside things like high tunnels and low tunnels and stuff like that. But there is another season extension, which is dealing with heat. And that's really more the season extension that we do. Now with the tunnel, um, with these high tunnels, I can grow food year round because it stays relatively mild here in the winter. It does freeze, we even get hard freezes. But with this amount of protection, I can keep brassicas and cold weather crops, things that can handle a mild freeze going all year uh, but the real beauty is in the summer when it's miserably hot outside and the sun is just sweltering um, it's relatively bearable in here the plants don't get as stressed and neither does the gardener so a lot of the pepper plants are starting to have a good bit of fruit on them. Some of it is a little on the, the younger side, not ready to harvest, but a good deal of it is. Um, like here, I've got lots of sweet banana peppers. I've just been harvesting these as I need them, but it's about time that I'm gonna need to harvest them and preserve them. With any fruit bearing plant, um, you wanna pick the fruit, obviously, but, uh, <laughs> You want to pick it before it gets fully ripe and mature. You don't want to leave it past that point because that tells the plant it's made its seeds. All any plant is trying to do is live long enough to make seeds. So if you leave ripe fruit or deadheaded dead flowers who the heads have dried up, if you don't deadhead them, if you leave that stuff on your plants for very long, your plant goes, oh, I did it, I made my seeds. And then it stops setting new blossoms. So uh, like with these banana peppers, they'd probably be fine on the plant for a little while longer. I mean, I want to let them get full size, 
but then I need to pick them all um, and freeze them or dry them or pickle them or whatever it is that I'm gonna do so that the plant will keep setting blossoms because if I do that, I can harvest peppers all the way up till when the freeze comes in October and November. These plants are all, I mean, they're all coming up. Of course, they're in raised beds, but they're all coming up almost to hip level for me. I mean, they're getting pretty good sized and I think looking pretty healthy. I didn't plant as many peppers this year as I did last year because I didn't use all the peppers last year. I had way more than I could feasibly process. So hopefully we'll make better use of them this year. All right, just past the high tunnel looking all foggy and dreamy. Here is the in-ground garden. Um, the in-ground garden, there's what we planted out here and then there's what's growing of its own accord. Um, we really like volunteers. I love plants that are resilient and want to grow. I love diversity in the garden. So among all of the plants that are here on purpose, there's some random things growing and I won't take them out. For instance, we have holy basil that has just popped up all over this garden. We did mow down a lot of what was growing in the walkways, but anything along the edge of the beds is here. This is a, this is a tomato plant. This is the spoon variety. These are like teeny tiny little tomatoes. They grow wild all over South Texas. Um, but they've been more recently distributed by Baker Creek. They gave them away as free seeds. If you ever plant spoon tomatoes, you will always have spoon tomatoes. They are ferocious uh, reseeders. And I've got several plants growing along here in the in-ground garden. And I like that. I like spoon tomatoes. They grow well wild, just sprawled on the ground. You don't really have to do much for them, stake them and all that stuff. So I'm glad they're here. So what's planted on purpose here are this okra, which is called Kibler okra. All of the plants that we planted out here, these are local heirloom varieties. We have the Kibler okra um, that was developed by Dr. Kibler. That's who we got these seeds from. Uh, we have Dutch Fork pie pumpkins. That's the sprawling things. You can see there are quite a few of these plants. And then this dark foliage is our chicken and dumplings cow peas. These all grow super well together. And I fully anticipate harvesting, I mean, we'll harvest hundreds and hundreds of pounds of food out of this garden. And enjoy the volunteers in the meantime. Here's some zinnias. I've got celosia growing along here. Lots of the holy basil, which holy basil is a great companion plant. The pollinators really love it. And I love it also um, because I use it for tea. And that is a cucumber. That's volunteer to keep an eye on that. Looks like we have a few different little cucumbers. So back here on the back side of this garden, um, this is a few tomato plants that I've got in these cattle panel cages. I'm just kind of trying this to see how productive they are in my like, main garden beds down here. I grow all of my tomatoes on cattle panels at pruned heavily down to one liter. So this is kind of just seeing how these do. Of course, it won't be a side-by-side -side comparison because we just put shade cloth over the tomatoes in the garden. But, you know, if I start feeling like these are terribly stressed, I could always throw a sheet or something over the top of them to give them some protection from the sun. I just wanted to see what would happen if we did that. So I really like this garden. I, and as it's filling in, um, I'm really pleased with it. Now, our walkways here, as you can see, they're just grass. We just mow them or weed eat them. Um, I used to have this as wood chips and I had the walkways thickly mulched with wood chips. The thing is with wood chips is they're going to break down and turn into soil. So if you have something like Bermuda grass, like we have zombie grass, it never goes away. It always comes back. Um, eventually, the wood chips turn to soil and the grass just grows up through it. And that's kind of what happened here. And I was having a hard time sourcing wood chips. So I just decided to kind of let it go this way. Eventually I may try to do something different, but it's fine this year. We'll get lots of food from it. Isn't this dreamy, this foggy morning? I've been eagerly awaiting my hibiscus to bloom. We'll get to that, but peep those guys down there. All right, so this has been the biggest development since the last garden tour. Maya, my dear sweet husband, um, built this shade cloth structure uh, with the help of our friend Wes. Uh, he did shoot a video of this. I'll put a link to it in case you missed it. 
but already I can see a visible difference in the stress level of my tomatoes. So if you look right here, these guys on the end are still really curled um, because obviously they're on the end. This is the south. This is where the sun goes across the sky. And so they're still getting a good bit of sun. All of these tomatoes were this curled before the shade cloth went up. Curling like this, just a sign of stress. It's not, actually not a terribly bad thing. Uh, stressed tomato plants typically taste better. Some of the chemical compounds they make when they're stressed actually do lend a better flavor. But stressed plants are also prone to disease and pest attacks. So you don't really want a lot of that. Um, a lot of these tomatoes though you can see are not curling and that is different than it was. So I haven't harvested many tomatoes yet. We had kind of our first larger slicer yesterday and I've been getting handfuls of cherry tomatoes at a time. I think there's some that are red here. Um, but we'll be swimming in them in a few weeks. Some of the plants have quite a bit of fruit on them and everything's looking really healthy and good. Oh, right there. That's a pretty big tomato that's blushing. Oh, look at this one. So here I've got my ground cherry plants. I've got these all over the garden. So you know ground cherries are ready whenever the husk turns yellow and they fall off. Um, some of these, there are husks that are falling off. These are empty, so that must have been like a pest or something. So far, I haven't really seen any that are ripe. I've actually grown ground cherries in the high tunnel before and didn't care for it. Um, we'll see how these do in the shade cloth. I have some not under the shade cloth also, and they may end up producing better. And in my, if, if, if I recall, when I had them in the high tunnel, they just, they didn't get ripe as fast and then they didn't get as sweet. Uh, so I think they do well with a lot of sun. So down here on the end, we have horseradish, um, which we've already harvested a whole lot of. And I guess we'll probably just have horseradish here forever because once you plant it somewhere it, it's pretty persistent and staying. But horseradish is a great thing to have a lot of. Very medicinal and tasty. Um, okay here's one of the hibiscus. This thing is covered in future blooms. Um, I remember at one point last year of them like peak blooming it was just so pink you could hardly see the foliage. I'm afraid I may miss that this year because I'm going to be going out of town for a handful of days. I've got two conferences to go to and uh, they're starting to bloom now and I'm like, man, hopefully, hopefully I get back before that happens again because I love when things peak and oftentimes you take care of plants just the entire year and the peak lasts just a few days. Uh, so you really want to be there for it. All down this garden row next to the tomatoes at the end here. These are all green beans and then these in the middle are um, actually Mexican sunflowers. So this is going to be kind of interesting. The green beans are already starting to put on little blooms. I love how fast green beans produce. Um, these are bush beans. And what I like to do is succession sow these. So throughout the garden I've got green beans in varying ages like that like I showed you there's some out in the, the high tunnel that are a few weeks behind these because the way bush beans work is when all of these start producing it's going to be about at the same time. They have a determined level of production and with bush beans whenever you grow like right here this is almost a 60 foot row of beans. I'll pick them all within the week that they come in and then I can can them and have them all at once. With pole beans, they're going to continue to set flowers and produce as long as they're supported and they have, you know, the nutrition, the water that they need. Um, and so I like to grow some pole beans, but that's typically for picking fresh as we want to eat them throughout the growing season. Here's a little peep at the wild cottage garden from this side. 
I actually had a comment this morning asking about the black weed fabric in our walkways and someone said how do you have weed fabric that plants don't grow through and I don't know what you saw but I don't have that um <laughs> they do grow through this I mean and this is good stuff but just even the best stuff especially when you have things like Bermuda grass stuff can poke through um we'll get this cleaned up and then put some gravel down and it'll it'll do a little better my I want to put right here I want to set up a table um, kind of just like a long outdoor table with several chairs at it because I love how kind of tucked in this space is like when I'm sitting out here or working right here and somebody drives down the driveway like they can't even see me between behind the asparagus and the shade cloth and so I think it would be really cool to have a nice table here um, I do have a table over in the pavilion but I'm thinking like a longer one that it could host more people because I have this image of like having tea in the garden and having you know a group of ladies over having a bible study or something you know like hosting a garden party and I think this would be the perfect place for a, a nice long table all right let's peep through here isn't this cool all this tall stuff I love to feel hidden and I'm you know the garden will get more of that feeling as we finish these structures like we have arbors to build and fences and um, the more structures we build the more kind of tucked in and hidden the garden will feel but this is really the first year to feel a lot of that feeling my old garden really felt like that because we had the fences we had a lot of structures we had a lot of tall trees around and so you could be in the garden and feel kind of enclosed which I love that um, I think any 90s kid that grew up like reading The Secret Garden and watching that movie and of course I know that's been remade over generations but um, I've always had that dream of a secret garden and there are starting to be places here that I really feel that. Alright here's the cottage garden. Beautiful color. I mean, it's a little overgrown in some places, but at this point, I'm just letting it do what it wants to do. Okay, let's head over here into the raised bed garden. All right, let's have a seat here. So right now, this morning, shortly after the sun comes up, before the fog is even lifted, it's about 80 degrees Fahrenheit out here, 26 Celsius, um, very humid. And we're going to have another 100 degree day today, 38 Celsius. That's hot. And as I said, it's just that's hot for anything that's living. Um, watering is super important when you're dealing with heat like that. Because plants can be hot and live. And they can even be dry and live, you know, for a period. Like you've got a window that they can handle a lot of heat. They can handle some dryness. They can't really handle extreme heat and dryness at the same time um, and in just a single day if you let your garden get too dry when it's really hot you can have damage that it can't bounce back from um, so yesterday really intense watering early really intense watering late into the evening um, I'm gonna start watering here in a minute as soon as I get done with this video. I'm gonna turn sprinklers on and just deeply water the garden. Um, you can water it in the middle of the day, but it's not going to be as effective as watering in the morning and the evening just because you're gonna have a lot of evaporation in the middle of the day when it's really hot. Um, and I think that the plants do better with early or late waterings because they're not stressed at that point. Um, it is really normal for things to like droop when it's really hot. That doesn't necessarily mean that it needs a lot of water. So if you watered a whole lot in the morning and then it's a hundred degree afternoon and everything's kind of wilty and droopy looking, don't think, oh no, I need to go water. It, it's just hot. I mean, I get a little wilty when it's a hundred degrees too. Like I was noticing this mint has kind of just got a little wilty look to it. Not too bad but it's just i mean for plants like this mint's very resilient but for plants that thrive when it's cool outside those are the ones that are going to struggle more when it's warm outside my chamomile is thoroughly done again an example of a cool weather plant that just can't hang when it gets warm uh, we'll cut that back and leave it i won't plant anything else here this is a perennial bed and so uh, we'll cut this back and just kind of mulch with all of these branches and then next year we'll have chamomile again i've been harvesting eggplants like crazy i did um 
just make a video yesterday of Baba Ganoush that'll be up around the same time as this garden tour actually this weekend so I'll put a link to the farmer's table um, I love Baba Ganoush which is eggplant dip but I've also pickled eggplants roasted them grilled them I am making the most of this little eggplant bed and it's producing a lot like I've been getting a lot of harvest let's see where should we go next the Jerusalem artichokes are doing what I hoped they would. <laughs> They're growing very well. Um, I planted this one little bed of Jerusalem artichokes and my whole plan here is to harvest all of the tubers that this grows and then plant them just to multiply them. I would just like to establish. And I'm actually thinking I may get a few more of these beds right here and just do this along here. Um, you may be able to see this looking at my garden, but I really love what different different heights of plants do when like you look out on the garden. I love that they kind of give that hemmed in and secret garden feel to have some really tall plants. And I typically try to use those strategically. Or, like I've got the asparagus here. Um, that bed's not grown up yet, but it's okra. It'll get really tall. These tall trellises that get covered with beans or tomatoes. And then as the case of the Jerusalem artichokes, if I have a row of them, it is just going to create some separation between spaces and some, I guess, privacy. I mean, it's not like I have anything out here that I need to be private from, but I just like the way that it feels. And this is a great resilient source of food. These beds have given me a lot of trouble in taking off. So a couple of the things, like these are some uh, butter beans. They're obviously not mad about whatever's happening in these beds. This is pineapple sage. This smells so good. Mm, I wish you could smell this. It's amazing. Uh, but I've had a really hard time with roly polies, uh, just eating down everything that I've planted, even with putting things out, trying to deal with them. So I don't know. Eventually these beds will be full. This will be one of those situations that I finally get it to grow about halfway through the season. And in the fall, it'll be really lush. Here are some more uh, pole beans. They're not producing just yet. And here we have bitter melons. Interestingly, this grew here last year. It came back on its own. Um, I did pull them out of the other side of the trellis. I just decided I only wanted one side because last year we had a lot of these and it was more than we could use. But aren't those fascinating looking? Very popular in Asian cooking. Um, I won't say that these are my favorite thing, but I do like them okay. I like them enough to grow one side of a trellis of them. The other side of the trellis here, I have tromboncino squash. This is one plant that's growing like this, um, which is pretty wild. And it hasn't put anything on yet, but just one of these plants can grow so much food. Go through here. Have some squash plants coming up. They're not yet producing more beans. Uh, right here, I've got noodle beans. So... These are already taking off. Uh, noodle beans, I have actually not cooked any of these yet this year. Noodle beans, asparagus beans, yard long beans, all of these Asian long beans. Um, I really like them, but you have to cook them differently than you would regular green beans. You don't want to boil these. They get waterlogged. They're kind of squeaky, like, if that makes sense. I and. Either you'll know exactly what I'm talking about or you don't notice when your food squeaks, but <laughs> noodle beans are squeaky beans. That's what we call them. And I, I find they do much better being sauteed in oil with seasoning. I have pickled them before, which is just okay. I mean, they're good, but I just don't need a ton of pickled beans. Um, but I really like just chopping them up, getting some oil hot in a pan, sauteing these with like garlic and some minced onion, uh, putting some salt on them, paprika, and that's how we eat them. Um, and then of course, if you want to lean into the Asian flavors using things like, uh, you know, peanut sauces or hoisin or soy sauce, different things like that. Um, I need to harvest these though. There are quite a few of them that are ready. And they made their way all down instead of all up. Oh, look at this. The volunteer lavender butterfly pea is bloomed. So if I come back this way, um, I've got parsley. I harvested a lot of parsley the other day. I cut these down 
and dried it. Here I've got some Armenian yard long cucumbers. Um, these are technically a melon. So you can harvest them about this size and cut them up. They make great pickles. Uh, they stay pretty crisp and you can use them in any application you would use a cucumber. Or you can let them get really large like this. I've got this one here to show you. Um, they, get, they get much bigger than this even. They can get about three feet long. Um, and they get really big around. When they get big like this, they are much more akin to a melon. They are a melon, but the texture is more melony. And they don't have a lot of flavor. Now, I've taken them before, scooped the seeds out and discarded them, and then, well, saved them, and then uh, taken the flesh and blended it with like yogurt and sweetener and made popsicles. Um, that's that's probably the best use. You can just eat it and it's very refreshing, especially get, if you get them good and cold. It just doesn't taste like a whole lot. It tastes like a very mild cucumber. That's the texture of a melon. So I would say it's best application is picked small. Um, last year I didn't get really any of these. I had a hard time with my plants, but I'm happy to have this one doing pretty okay. It's starting to struggle in the heat, um, but it, you know, I'll be able to get a good harvest over it before it dies. Here are the ground cherry plants that are not in the sun or under the shade cloth. These are in the sun. They still are not ripe yet. Look at these lettuce leaf basil plants. Aren't these beautiful? I just think this is this is such a cool basil to me with these huge leaves. Um, let's see if I can show you. So this has all the scent and the flavor of basil, but in these massive leaves. It's called lettuce leaf, mammoth leaf. Um, there are a couple different varieties, all very similar. My favorite thing to do with these is make wraps and have them like a sandwich, like the outer lettuce of a sandwich. Um, or you can just take a whole leaf of this and like put it on a burger in place of lettuce. And so you're getting that great basil flavor with the, the texture of like a crunchy piece of lettuce. Or you can just cut this up and use it like basil. Like I dried a bunch of it recently and mixed it in with the other culinary basil. I, I really like these plants. Um, I, I don't think I would want this to be the only variety of basil I grow. I couldn't just pick one, um, but it is definitely always going to be on the list for me. Speaking of basils, this is kind of my basil corner. Here we have some holy basil, more lettuce leaf, sweet basil, purple opal, and a random nasturtium here in the corner. Um, this is a great plant. I don't have a ton of nasturtium in the garden this year. A lot of times it reseeds, so I don't plant a bunch of it, and I guess I should have, but um, everything on this plant is edible, the leaves, the flowers, and it's also just really pretty and a great companion plant. Make sure there's no bugs in here before I eat it. <laughs> mm. Nasturtium is really good. It's a little spicy. It has kind of like a wasabi horseradish flavor to it, but it's really great to put on salads um, because that kick goes well with salads. And another thing that's really good to do with the leaves is I'll take several of them and roll them up and just chop them so they're long, thin strips and uh, put those on on tacos. It's, it's nice for that because it does have that spicy kick. All right, I was noticing this. This is a fennel, and I have a little caterpillar here. So these, oh, here's another one. So these are um, swallowtail caterpillars. The host plant for swallowtail caterpillars is like the fennel, carrot, family, parsley. And that's another reason why I was saying I needed to go ahead and harvest more parsley because as long as these guys are starting to show up they're going to strip clean anything that they want to eat so i've got some other fennel i'm going to harvest as well um, and just get these things out this is dill and i've been cutting this for i made tartare which is a cold cucumber soup i i like doing the bouquets and pickles um, so i may need to go ahead and harvest some of this before the caterpillars come and get it i don't like killing swallowtail caterpillars i usually just let them have the host plants but i try to harvest what i want from them first so i've been telling you guys about how i succession sow squash 
because squash just don't last super long in my garden. These guys are coming to their bitter end. Um, they still had some fruit on them, so I was trying to let them mature it, but the rest of this row has already been pulled. These are gonna be pulled very soon. That's okay because we succession sow, which means that I should be harvesting from these squash plants about the time that I pull those out. I've got baby squash on here. And then when these are starting to get sick, the ones I showed you over there will be about ready to produce. All right. Through here, um, this is the silver slicer cucumbers. Now, I always brag on silver slicer's ability to keep producing and stay tasty when it is very hot. But you will notice here, um, this plant is showing some kind of sickly signs, some leaves, some disease, and some stress. Even the best cucumber struggles when it's 100 degrees. So if things are starting to get really crispy like this, if it's very hot, that is unfortunately relatively unavoidable. I will probably have the Armenian whites longer than I have these, just because it is technically a melon, so it does better with the heat. But this is why I wanted more cucumbers down in the high tunnel with the shade cloth, because I hope that I'll be able to get harvest, you know, during other than the very short window before it gets very hot because with the shade cloth hopefully that'll work um I'm, i think that we'll be able to harvest these cucumbers for at least another week or two the weather's supposed to break in like three days it's supposed to start raining and cool off till like 90 um 32 celsius so that's still hot but as far as plants go, they can handle 90 a lot better than they can handle 100. So I hope that things like this in the garden hold out until that reprieve comes because I'd like to harvest as much as possible. And if they die, that definitely cuts it short. One thing that does not mind the heat at all is okra. Um, I've actually never seen okra plants get stressed due to heat. If they've got decent soil and enough water, they stay uh, very healthy and they even start taking off when it's really hot. Um, I, you know, I was letting my volunteers grow in the walkway while well, a whole bunch more popped up. I'm actually going to pull these out because that's probably a little more than I need to be trying to navigate around out here. You know, I showed you guys that I had a Kajari melon that volunteered here on this trellis with the cucumbers. See there? Well, in this bed, I hadn't noticed it. I saw the foliage and I just assumed it was part of the Kajari melon. But then I was walking through here um, a week or so ago and realized there's actually a full-size watermelon here um, that just is growing out into the walkway. So I was kind of glad to see that guy. Interestingly, as much as the actual cucumbers struggle in the heat, the Mexican sour gherkins don't mind it one bit. In fact, they become even more prolific, I think, when it gets very hot. Um, these all came back either from, some of them looked like they reseeded. There would be like a cluster of plants growing. Some of these, these actually grow tubers. And if you are in a place where they can be perennial, they will be. Um, if you're in a place that's cold, you can dig the tubers up at the end of the season and store them and grow them the next year. And um, I think that's what happened here because these plants came up on their own and got very established very quickly. And now I think they'll probably end up everywhere. Down here, are the cherry tomatoes and small tomatoes. Here's my Brad's Atomic Grapes and Barry's Crazy Cherry, the multiflora that makes these huge clusters. Some of these are ripe. Um, you can see there's a good bit of curling here. These don't have a shade cloth. They'll be okay without a shade cloth. They'll still be very prolific, but I haven't harvested much from them yet. They haven't really ripened a whole lot. Some of them are getting close though. I think this is the green stalk I'm most impressed with this year. I put these bare root strawberries in this year and they are so big already they're putting off runners. Which with these, I typically just take them and redirect them back into a cup. You can actually take like pots and fill soil in them and you don't cut these off, you just Say you have a pot with soil, you just stick this runner down into that pot, and I usually just nestle it here into one of the cups of the green stalk until this roots. And once this roots, you can cut it loose and you have a new strawberry plant. 
these containers are kind of funny. Uh, so here, this is a sweet potato vine. Um, this will end up by the end of the season being like massive and everywhere. And I will like that very much. I, I do have a volunteer tomato plant growing in this pot and it's growing so upright that I'm just going to let it go. I just thought it was really cool that that started growing there. The fog is lifting. Now this is the, um, this is a variegated basil. This actually doesn't go to seed. I think it's called Perpetua. I just buy the plant starts every year, but you could take cuttings and root them to make more plants. I cut the top half of this plant off uh, probably about a week ago. I mean, it was down to here and it's already back up to here. Isn't that wild? It smells so good. Um, I've got some different melons and cucumbers that I've put in over here. I'm actually not sure what this is. I can't remember. I'm sure I have a note on my phone. Sometimes I just like to wait. It's like a little surprise party I have for myself. Um, oregano. These are ground cherries. They're a little bit younger than the others. Over here is uh, Seychelles pole beans. Uh, those are young. Again, I like succession sowing so I can just come out and harvest. I love preserving and if you're trying to grow much of your family's food, you're going to have to preserve because a lot of things have a short window and you get a whole lot at once, way more than you can possibly eat. But my real goal with the garden is that I want to be able to go out and harvest and cook that day as much as possible throughout the year. And as I said, thankfully with season extension both ways, uh, into the cold and into the heat, I'm actually able to do that quite a lot, especially living in, in a place with mild winters like South Carolina. But a lot of that comes down to how you garden. Um, things like succession sowing, uh, growing a fall garden, growing things just at any point of the year that you think you can get away with it, trying to grow it. And then planting. I don't have one time that I plant. I'm planting constantly throughout the year. I'm always pulling things out and putting new things in. That's really how you get to fresh eat throughout a long period of time in a garden. And so like these beans are coming up you know, we will have all the other beans picked and canned before these even start producing. And that's good. That's how I want it to be. Oh my goodness. I know I've already showed you all this, but I cannot believe the amount of blooms on these berries, crazy cherry tomatoes. Isn't that wild? So many. This is a small melon that I just put in here again. Um, I, th I thought maybe with this one I could let it run up the trellis some and then run down into the walkway some and let it sprawl. Um, it seems to be trying to go into the tomatoes, which is the one place I don't really want it to go. Um, when it comes to directing things to where you want them, you pretty much have to check on them every single day because uh, things can really grow a few inches a day this time of year. Well, there it is. And there's my garden. I went kind of quick through it on this tour um, because I, I mean, it's just steadily getting hotter and hotter and I actually have some work I need to get done. But it, it's weird. This, this year's been a little bit different. Normally I would say about right now is when the garden peaks. I haven't even started harvesting tomatoes yet this year though. So um, I definitely think our peak is going to be a little bit later, hopefully not hindered by this heat wave. I'm definitely pulling in a lot of food. I mean, I've, I've harvested just in the last handful of days, I've harvested over a hundred pounds of food out of this garden, especially since the squash have been coming in really heavy, all the eggplants, I've been harvesting some peppers. And then of course I've been getting lots of cucumbers. Um, and then in another few weeks, it's going to be more eggplants, tomatoes, lots more peppers, beans. Um, we have a bunch of pumpkins that are growing out in the woods where the pigs used to be. And I was actually noticing that they were starting to ripen and get ready to where they're about to start be able to be curing. Um, and that's just all, I, I call it free food. Like food that I didn't plant that's just growing somewhere. I get to just go out and collect a bunch of pumpkins that I, I did literally nothing for other than own pigs. Um, and I own the pigs for the bacon, not the pumpkins, but it's like a bonus. So yeah, we're definitely thick in the food 
and I'm loving it. I'm staying super busy in the kitchen. I am posting a lot over on the farmer's table, which is my cooking channel. As I mentioned, I'll put a link to that and I will catch up with you guys later. We'll have another garden tour here soon, which I think will probably be the peak garden tour, uh, the next one. Thank you all for hanging out with me today and all the days you do. I bless you until next time.